I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I hope that meditation was helpful for you. Uh, I enjoyed it. And <clears throat> it illustrates the topic I hope to get into, which is why do we take in the good? And as Kathleen O'Day asked me, um, related to what I talked about in, in our kind of informal beginning, before our formal beginning at 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, uh, I was talking about the balance or the difference between, the difference between chasing the ball in a compelled, driven, craving sort of way compared to frictionless productivity. My silly but maybe descriptive phrase for an alternative way of being in which we are being productive without rubbing up against reality along the way, even if some of what we're experiencing while being productive is perhaps unpleasant. Maybe we're tired or we've got to kind of deal with a difficulty or a person with a difficulty. But we don't have to have friction. We don't have to resist reality. Uh, it's a very different feeling for, for accomplishing things. And it's an experience that we can take in over time. So I want to talk with you about um, taking in the good, which you know is a phrase that I use routinely. And why do we do it in a deep way? And then what I want to do uh, in future meetings here, after we lay this as a foundation, is in the seven weeks or that I'm here, seven weeks that follow, um, to explore the seven factors of enlightenment the seven factors of awakening laid out in the Buddhist path uh, and use the notion or, or foundation of taking in the good as preparation or, or a skillful means when we get into each of those seven themes, which are investigation, uh, mindfulness, energy, um, tranquility, concentration and equanimity. And I know there's another one that's going to come to me in just a minute here. Oh, bliss. I forgot bliss. How could I possibly forget bliss? Anyway, those are the seven. And uh, we'll be exploring them uh, later on. Okay, so why do we take in the good? Four reasons. As context, what's it like to exist? As I think George Orwell put it, to see what is under one's nose takes a constant struggle. You are existing. I am existing. We are all existing. Squirrels are existing. Rocks are existing. We're, we are aware of existing. What is the nature of existing? It, it's such an important question because that's what we're doing continuously. That's what we're being continuously. That's what we're having continuously. We're existing. We notice three things about existing, three fundamental attributes. One is that um, things are continually ending. Many things are continually ending, which means that this moment of reality, as this moment, is continually ending. It's passing away. It's impermanent. It's transient, this moment of reality, because many things in it are changing, they're ending. A second thing that we notice, though, is that many things are arising. The next moment arises. This moment passes away, the next moment arises continuously. And um, I think Suzuki Roshi defined enlightenment in, in some ways, enlightenment is letting go of this moment while giving over to or surrendering to the next one, which is a really interesting way to describe something as lofty as enlightenment in such a down-to-earth sort of way. Letting go of this moment while receiving the next one continuously. So much deep teaching is about this fundamental matters of uh, leavings and appearings, endings and arisings continuously. So these are these two central aspects of existing, right? And there's a third, which is that 
Some things persist. Most of them don't persist forever. They ultimately are impermanent. But meanwhile, they have a stability about them. A particular eddy in the river of time persists for a while until, like all eddies, it disperses eventually. This body persists for a while until it too disperses eventually. Um, in that context, then, we have practice in three forms. We have practice in the form of letting go, allowing endings, and perhaps particularly letting go, releasing, renouncing, relinquishing, major themes in Buddhist practice, including relinquishment, things that are not good for us and others, major practice of letting go. And it can be powerful to make the gesture of the hand or the body, just letting go, letting go, letting go. A second major aspect of practice is uh, openness to what is arising and even a kind of receptivity and uh, encouragement of what is beneficial to arise. We appreciate it, we encourage it, we invite it, we plant the seeds of it. Buddha was a farmer and he talked about essentially the seeds of things and fertilizing them through the nutriments that would encourage wholesome states of mind to arise. So you could ask yourself here as well, alongside the question of what aspect of your practice is about letting go? Lately, I've been really focusing on letting go of my habit of chasing the red ball, letting go. And over here, what are we encouraging? What are we opening to? What is the new that we are turning to and welcoming? The wonderful teacher and professor at Naropa, Galen Ferguson, um, talks about an attitude of welcoming, welcoming including other people. You see a person, you look in their eyes, can you welcome what you see there? Can you welcome what you feel inside after you see what you see there? Can you rest in a feeling of welcoming with the people in your life? Simple, uh, kind of a don't know mind that's welcoming. Beginner's mind welcomes, all right? And then there's this third aspect, which is pers about persisting. What do we encourage to persist? What do we encourage to stabilize in our life? And that's one of the, that takes us into one of the first of the four main reasons for taking in the good. To frankly build the good inside and grow the good inside that you care about. So what I mean technically about taking in the good is helping experiences leave lasting traces behind in the physical structures of your body so that you move from states of happiness to trait happiness. You move from states, experiences of lovingness or gratitude or grit or determination or self-compassion or commitment to justice. You move from these experiences into developing trait happiness, trait grit, trait compassion, trait commitment to justice. All right? So in this challenging world, we need to build strengths inside. You know, I was talking with my wife earlier today, and <clears throat> to put it really kind of bluntly, um, I was telling her I was going to be exploring why do we take in the good? And I may, you know, I paused and I said, well, partly it's because we are dying. We need to take in the good to build up you know, resources inside, capabilities, skills, inclinations, moods, attitudes. Um, we need to take in the good to grow the good inside ourselves. And as you may know, the brain has a bias in that it learns rapidly from painful experiences and slowly from positive ones, even though most of what we want to grow inside ourselves involves positive experiences. So we can help our brains by deliberately slowing down to stay with whatever you want to cultivate. 
and to stay with, as we did during the meditation, the sense of openness and warm-heartedness and a kind of sweetness, a sukha, a contentment. That's the first of the four reasons. We want to grow the good. It's okay to grow the good. Uh, some people, I've, I've, I remember a dinner conversation I had uh, some years ago. My, fr- my friend set me up, who shall, shall be nameless, and uh, I was with a bunch of people who were deeply committed to a kind of non-dual, choiceless awareness orientation. And it was almost unfathomable to them why it would be helpful to deliberately take in the good. And yet, throughout Buddhist practice, throughout the spiritual and wisdom traditions of the world, throughout the secular traditions of coping, resilience, and well-being, there's an enormous emphasis on, on stabilizing and growing various character strengths, various uh, virtues, various factors, various qualities inside that help us be happier and help us function better and have more to offer to other people. Uh, what I'm talking about here in terms of in Sanskrit and Pali, bhavana, cultivation, is just completely central to, uh, to serious contemplative practice. It's okay. It's okay. It doesn't violate mindfulness somehow to help your experiences leave beneficial residues behind. That's one reason. A second reason to take in the good is to heal ourselves. Because that which is healed typically takes two forms, either the presence of the bad or the absence of the good. And I mean bad and good pragmatically. So presence of the bad might be times we were um, yelled at when we were young or bullied or scared or even traumatized. Uh, Maybe the presence of the of the bad is, you know, the internalization of peop- of you know systemic forms of oppression that are structural in society that become internalized over time. On the one hand, and on the other hand, we want to heal the absence of the good, because for many reasons, including the fact that the absence of the good, the absence of love, the absence of feelings of worth the absence of opportunities for agency and efficacy and potency and a healthy power, Um, the absence of opportunities to contribute and to have your talents really used, the absence of those things, the absence of others who can receive your love, oof, that can use a lot of healing as well. So, We take in the good in the second major reason for doing it because we can bring in experiences that are natural um, soothers, natural medicine, natural balms for the presence of the bad, for we could say, you know, that kind of a wound. So for example, if there in your history as a child or as an adult, are painful feelings of of worthlessness. Well, an alternative to that that's well matched to those feelings of worthlessness is the natural medicine for them would be experiences of worth today. Through many means, including uh, the sense of being with others who value you, who appreciate you, who like you, who find worth in you, who choose you, who who are present with you in a caring way, that can be taken in. Um, You can also have a sense of your worth, maybe simply directly observing your your good intentions, your capabilities, your contributions, or maybe just a sense of your deep, bone deep, inherent worth innately, your bodhicitta, underlying Buddha nature inside you, true nature. Um, And so as you may well know in my material on linking, which is not something I invented. I've just tried to describe it in a very essential kind of way. When we do what I'm describing to heal ourselves, we're aware of two things at once. We are um, bringing in what we long for. We are bringing in uh, uh, the medicine that we need that's matched to what's been hurting. And we're aware of both of them at the same time. In the foreground of awareness, big, 
um, that which is really beneficial and well-matched to the wound. And then in the background, off to the side, that old pain. Keeping um, the positive experience, the positive beneficial material big and not getting hijacked by the old pain. And you can do much the same to heal yourself if, in your case, like me, uh, it's not so much that bad things happen to you, is that there was a dearth, an absence, a thin soup of good ones that, or especially that were internalized. There may well have been uh, various good facts in your life, but if different factors or processes got in the way of the internalization of them, as they did in my case, um, then you end up with what I would describe for myself as a big hole in your heart, an empty, longing, hurting place there. And so there too, what do you long for? If you long for feeling cared about, can you look for opportunities today to feel authentically cared about? Even if it's not a million dollar experience, even if it's not, you know, soulmate, a life partner love, which of course would be wonderful to have, but still there is some caring for you. Can you feel it? And while feeling it, be aware of that empty longing hollow place inside into which that current experience, the, the next experience again and again and again, of what you long for can go into you. So you finally get the heart food, the soul food that you should have received and should have internalized when you were young, but just didn't. And now you can do that. So that's the second reason why we take in the good. We take in the good to heal ourselves. It's medicine. Very often we push away what we most long for and that which would most heal us. Yeah. Perhaps simply just being yourself and letting it be okay <laughs> to be the mess that you are, that I am. <laughs> letting it be okay to kind of be a mess, a, you know, a hot mess as it were even. Um, Maybe that's a lot of healing for you because just letting yourself be that way is a healing for all the times, for many of the times you haven't let yourself or you felt it was bad or wrong to just be who you are, warts and all. Maybe that's a key medicine for you. Yeah. And then there's a third reason, <clears throat> which is right at the heart, at the fulcrum of Buddhist practice, as I understand it, in certainly early Buddhism, the, the central teachings kind of straight from the Buddha. Um, it's how to exist in a, with life, which is um, unstable. Living is unstable. Living includes painful experiences, and living includes the fact that uh, pleasant experiences end. These are facts of existence. How do we live with them without adding craving? Without adding craving. How do we do that? In other words, in terms of the structure of the Four Noble Truths, how do we live with dukkha, the first noble truth, which is not yet suffering? It's simply a kind of inherent instability in living, the, the fact that there are sometimes painful experiences, and, pain, and pleasant experiences end. These are the three attributes of dukkha, the first noble truth. How do we live with dukkha without adding tanha, the second noble truth, routinely translated pretty accurately as craving, based on something missing, something wrong. The root of the word for tanha is thirst. Something's missing, which then initiates biologically a drive state and we chase the ball or other kinds of things. So how do we help ourselves increasingly abide in this life in a full way, fully engaged, as most of us as householders, not as monastics, committed, hopefully, to you know, contributing where we can, enjoying what we can, and helping 
where we can, others and, and the world altogether. How do we do that without getting sucked into the biologically driven habits of craving? Deep, profound matter. And there are many, many teachings in the Buddhist tradition about how to do that. And I want to highlight one here that is, that, that is the third reason to take in the good. Because when we take in the good, in other words, when we allow an authentic, always authentic experience of, you know, let's say some version of peacefulness, calming, centering, feeling strong and capable, even if we're dealing with challenges, when we have that kind of an experience or other forms of taking in the good, we start to feel like our needs are being met in the present. And as we repeatedly internalize experiences of needs met in the present, we start moving from experiences of needs met in the present to a, to a trait sense of needs met enough in the present. We start moving to a trait sense of enoughness, all rightness, and a resting in love. That naturally starts to happen. And as we rest increasingly, in the felt sense of needs met enough in the moment through taking in the good again and again and again, the basis for craving gradually fades away. Nothing is missing. There's no imbalance. Nothing is wrong in the present. Now, the present may well include pain. It may include injustice that you're trying to do something about. It may include the need to set a boundary, to stand up for yourself. But on what basis? On the basis of things that are missing and wrong, deficits and disturbances, thus initiating craving and suffering and harm? Do, you, do we do it on that basis? Or do we deal with, do we pursue our aims? Do we deal with challenges? Do we draw boundaries? Do we assert ourselves with others on the basis in the present of feeling already enough? basically all right, and rested in love. Changes everything. And as we repeatedly take in the good, the biological basis, the actual basis for any kind of craving, craving fades away. That's the third big good reason to take in the good. And it's been one that's been extremely interesting to me personally. And you can just watch it. You can be mindful of more or less craving, Right? So more craving, more contraction, more sense of pressure in the body, more sense of me, you know, taking it personally. All these are indicators. All these indicators. Okay. And then watch, watch that sense of craving as you start to feel calmer and safer. Three basic needs of all animals, safety, satisfaction, and connection. So you start to feel that your need for safety is being met enough in the present. That driver of craving fades. What happens when you start feeling grateful or that you've accomplished something? You're gratified in the satisfaction of a goal. Your need for satisfaction is increasingly met. Craving diminishes. What happens when you start to feel uh, friendly with others, uh, caring toward them, connected with them, or that you're on the receiving end of caring, what happens then? Craving reduces. You just watch it. <laughs> it's kind of like I visualize it because I, you know, I'm old enough to remember seeing amplifiers and so forth in dormitories with all these lights going up or down and different wavelengths, I guess, of the music rising and falling, you know, and you can just see craving rising, 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 rising. And as you take in the good, craving falling, diminishing. Now, I'm using the word craving in a very specific sense that's not um, usually healthy. Once in a while, I see a question coming in at 10 minutes after the hour. Once in a while, you know, just to survive, to deal with something, okay, we drop into craving, maybe. You know, we crave to get our kids out of a burning building. All right. But it's a fairly passing thing. And I think the Buddha was right. 
I think more craving equals more suffering. Less craving equals less suffering. And what's wonderful is to explore the alternative to craving while leading a motivated, rich, yummy, and contributing life. How do we live a rich, yummy, and contributing life without craving? That's a lot of what we're exploring here. And a key to that is repeatedly taking in the good. As at the heart, really, a key process, a key engine of deep Buddhist practice is to repeatedly take in the good, to fill yourself up already so you're not seeking or grabbing more to fill some kind of hole inside yourself. That's the third big reason for taking in the good. I think it's a huge mistake that many people make in practice to push away the good because they're afraid they're gonna cling to it. Actually, when we really take in the good, we stop clinging to it because we already got it. And then the fourth reason for taking in the good. This is a little harder to talk about, and I hope you'll forgive me for being probably not that articulate about this. And I invite you to just kind of, you know, maybe allow your mind to sort of open into a almost a mystery here, which is that as we take in the good and we let it sink in, the Buddha talked a lot about uh, patana, establishing. What is being established in us and where are we establishing ourselves? Where are you establishing yourself? Increasingly, progressively, as you progress, in your own path of awakening. And as we take in the good and we settle down some and we begin to establish ourselves in the present, feeling like an expression locally of reality altogether, we start resting in a sense of the inherent goodness of reality altogether. Now, reality altogether in includes many things that are not good, that are bad, like hungry children, um, wars, uh, things that kill people, that hurt people, not good. But reality as reality, the whole Big Bang universe is um, extraordinary gift. We are living and the extraordinary bounty of the Big Bang, the generative givingness of every arising moment as the temporal bubble of the universe expands and enabling uh, the next moment to arise, we are living at the edge of creation continuously as the four-dimensional Big Bang universe is expanding. Three dimensions of space, one of time, four dimensions, we're living on the edge of the expansion of the dimension of time. And in ways that are indetectable individually, uh, the expansion of the spatial dimensions as well. We can detect the expansion of the temporal dimension of time. We're living in creation continuously. How good is that? That's good. So the fourth reason to take in the good is that it brings us into the inherent goodness of reality as reality altogether, um, enabling us to be here and blessing us continuously with the bountiful gift of the next ar arising moment. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, those are four reasons to take in the good to build the strengths inside, to cultivate the factors inside we need for well-being and coping and having things we can offer to others. Second, we take in the good to heal ourselves. Third, we take in the good 
to defuel the engine of craving and to allow ourselves to rest in the present and pursue our goals and live a full life without having a, a, a sense of something missing, something wrong that you know along the way. And the fourth reason they take in the good is that it brings us, it opens us out into the inherent goodness of reality altogether that we are one with in our fundamental nature. So on the basis of all that, maybe one or two of you would like to talk with me. If you wanna pop to the front of the line, push the raise hand button in the reactions emoji thingy, the bottom of the Zoom screen. It's got a smiley face with a plus sign on it. You can go there and push the button that has you raise your hand if you want. Um, I do say that if you're gonna talk with me in, in front of everybody, um, let's see, please have a focused, succinct, brief question about a topic of general interest related to what I've been talking about here. And then meanwhile, let me take a peek at some of the um, comments and questions, yeah, that have come in. All right, great, um, great, great, great. Uh, Jesse asks at um, 7.12, 12 minutes past the hour, Rick, can I create an embodied experience of the good through meditation? Definitely. Um, that's what usually happens when people meditate. Sometimes meditation might be less pleasant. Um, that's why I think, unless there's a very specific reason for it, you know, we should support our bodies in, to be in a state of well-being and pain-free. Now, if your knee starts to hurt, it's okay to move it. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to just be with the pain for a while, but once you learn how to be with the pain, why, why add pain? <laughs> uh, if you could simply move and let your mind, therefore, be, be calmer and happier and have more of those embodied experiences of the good in meditation. How does the brain change by taking in the good? Uh, the brain changes uh, through learning and uh, both positive and negative learning. So we take in the bad. The brain is designed to rapidly internalize um, painful, hurtful, uh, angry, irritated, stressed, wounded, et cetera, experiences. And you know, different little structures in the brain change. Tiny, tiny little uh, synaptic activity starts to alter. Little tendrils start to grow, connecting other neurons with each other. I mean, the mechanisms of neuroplasticity are, are multiple. Uh, probably well over two dozen have been identified so far. And when we um, internalize um, beneficial experiences and start developing traits that are stabilized in the mind, if the mind is changed in a durable way, a stable way, well, the brain must have changed as well as the physical basis within the natural frame of the Big Bang universe, ordinary reality. The brain, brain changing is the physical basis, the necessary basis for your mind changing. So if your mind has changed, your brain must have changed as well. And uh, where science has established that people who develop certain positive traits, including through meditation, have structural and functional changes in different neural networks that are involved with those functions, like regulating attention, regulating emotions, um, uh, deepening bodily awareness, and a shifting and expanding and loosening sense of self, etc. Okay, great. Um, did someone read in one of my books to tap your third eye while taking in the good to reinforce the experience? Um, I would not have said that. Uh, and I'm not speaking against chakras or anything. It's more like I just don't know. Um, I will say uh, a method I learned from a million years ago in neuro-linguistic programming is that sometimes if you want, you can anchor an experience by associating a physical cue, such as touching yourself in the area of the heart when you're wanting to, for example, anchor a sense of being, being strong-hearted you know, like open-hearted while also being serious and de determined, for example. I might have said something like that. Okay, good. Great, 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 great. And as you may well know, I've written and taught extensively about taking in the good. Almost all of that is freely offered one way or another. 
And, um, you know, there are a lot of details about it, but the essence is really simple. Have it, enjoy it. Have the experiences that um, are beneficial for you and are the seeds of what you want to grow inside yourself. We learn from experiences. Experiences are the necessary condition for learning broadly. But then help those experiences sink in. Enjoy it. Have it and enjoy it. Stay with it for a breath or longer. Feel it in your body. Appreciate and enjoy what feels good about it, all three of which are factors of neuroplastic change, again and again and again. And if you want to heal yourself, then you can explore linking in which you're aware of that beneficial experience while also being aware of some wound inside you or some lack inside you that this experience is the natural medicine for. Okay, so I'm going to move through the group and I'm going to make myself be succinct, just like you, Liz. So you're going to be the first person. Uh, I'm going to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm great. All right, what's your question? You're asking Liz. When? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Yeah. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, yeah. I am a person. I'm an el elder, uh, and I've been working with my wounding for many, many years through therapy and spiritual practice. Yeah. I'm thrilled to see that I've actually gotten somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my favorite line is, I'm glad I live long enough to see it. Hey. Hey. Um, but, What's your question? Yeah. Yes. What about um, um, the wounding? The, yeah, is the that, trauma. Is that a, yeah, the, the trauma. I see your question I'm, here I'm in the still, chat. I'm, yeah. still, I'm still reaching my toe out to see if it's there. Yeah. constantly checking yeah what what does one do with that uh one trains oneself not to do that to stay with the good never to move to see is the trauma still there oh if i follow you right um certain events uh it's understandable every time we think about them or are reminded of them we get a jolt and i think it's possible in certain cases to think about the event uh, and have no jolt at all. But I, I think it's actually realistic and, and to tolerate and accept the fact that there could well be a jolt. You, you think of that person you lost tragically, it's a jolt. You think you go back to that combat tour, it's a jolt. You know, you, you feel it. Um, on the other hand, uh, as we heal, we become increasingly not preoccupied by it. It doesn't invade us. Okay. Now, it's understandable that you're, from time to time, you might have the habit of, um, in effect, checking. You know, like an obsessive compulsive person would check that they turned off the faucet uh, in their home to kind of check, hey, do I still get the jolt? My suggestion would be try to stop doing that uh, because, you know, unless you're really mindful of it at the time, when you get the jolt, it can reinforce the trauma it, or you know, it makes it harder to really, really gradually undo it, yeah. And so um, that's what one thing I would suggest. And if you are going to be in touch with that material, then use linking, you know? Now, minimally, you can be mindful of it in very spacious awareness. That's a kind of linking because you're linking the spaciousness of undisturbed awareness with a disturbing memory or body sensation or emotion or so forth, right? But generally, um, you know, my view is that if a person can be aware of the trauma material while also being aware of something beneficial that's bigger than the trauma material, where the bulk of their attention is resting on the beneficial material with the trauma material off to the side, they can do, if you can do that without a therapist present, why not do it? Why not help yourself in this way? As long as you don't get hijacked by and sucked into the trauma. And if you do, just drop it and whoop, focus only on the positive, okay? Yes, this is a choice. It totally is a choice. And uh, you want the good to win. Yes. So 
You know, I, I see a lot of moxie in you. You didn't get this far <laughs> without being a bit of a badass. That's good. <laughs> That's right. So you want to bring that spirit to it too. You're not hate. You're not hating the pain. You're not hating the trauma. But you're 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 intent on healing. You're like a good doctor to yourself. Um, but there okay. is a lot of acceptance, which is yeah, important. That too. All right. Thanks, Liz. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, it's great. This is a lightning round. <laughs> I, see, I see the thumb over there. Ayeli and David. Thank you, David. All right. Good. All right, Karen, I'm asking you to unmute. Short and sweet. What's your question? Hi, Rick. Um, I went through a breakup, a very tough breakup last month, and I find myself being very depressed and mm. have difficulty in um, focusing on yeah. the good and um, I realized that I've been um, in the relationship that makes me um, forget about my friends and I don't have a lot of mm. friends and family around. Yeah. And I wonder how I can, at this point, I just feel like um, it's so hard for me to focus on the good and accept um, um, having like, yeah. when friends want to visit me, I also feel like, oh, after they leave and I feel lonely, I feel sad. And um, I also find it very hard to um, feel yeah. the joy of like hanging out with other friends. Yeah. So, so I wonder, Karen, what's your question? <laughs> yeah. And um, all that. I wonder what can I do at this point? Yeah. Because I feel like I need some therapy, but also I want to have something to work on every day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I feel both compassion for you and like it's it's a loss, first, first of all. And I can also feel your plucky spirit, you know, you're looking for a way to help yourself and that's great. So there's a natural rhythm. To be clear, uh, we take in the good when it's authentic, when it's authentic to feel it and to internalize it. And when we've had a loss or we've been shocked by something or we're just completely carried by a wave of anger or let's say, or remorse or grief. All you can do is ride the wave for a while. So you've had a loss. It's a big deal, right? And there's a place for, and I write about this a lot, you know, how to be with it, your being with it, with hopefully with compassion for yourself. So I'd wonder about that. You know, can you practice compassion for yourself, right? Um, can you accept how you feel? Can you let the feelings flow? You know, the three main ways to practice are to basically let be, let go, and let in. So when we're letting be, whew, we want to really let it be. And it may be that you can only be with it for short periods of time. It's too painful. And then it's okay. Disengage. Watch a cat video on YouTube. Look out the window. You know, jump up and down. Um, eat a cookie. It's okay, and then come back to it and keep letting it flow. So that's kind of a lot of what I'm hearing where you are just right now and give yourself a break. Don't let people boss you around or bully you to get over it. You know, why are you still upset? It's been a month already. Forget it. You know, grieving, loss, mourning has its own rhythms and it'll surprise us. We'll think that we're on the other side of it. And then the next even bigger wave, comes along. We don't know. You got, you know, it's, we don't know. It's, it's okay. So that, I would say that. I think it's also important to be active at times like this, not to suppress the feelings, but to be active alongside them. You know, exercise, daily activities, things you enjoy doing that, are, that, that draw your attention away from the, the loss, that can be really helpful. Um, and then other people, certainly, uh, you know, reminding yourself that there's nothing to be ashamed of here. Many, the truth is most relationships end, you know, roughly two, basically two thirds of all marriages end, let alone, you know, relationships prior and the, including the equivalent of marriage, um, you know, and so it's, it, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's okay. You can have your head high. That would be another thing I, I would offer. We tend to, you know, it's like, we curl over, maybe we're a little ashamed, a little inadequate, or a little embarrassed, maybe embarrassed about how we feel. Nope. Head up. Shoulders back. Digni carefree dignity. 
You know, you didn't do anything wrong. It's okay. And then you're going forward. So those would be some thoughts. I see the heart. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, good. All right. Thanks, Karen. Is that okay? That's okay? Okay, good. You muted yourself, I see. I'll just go with the heart. All right, take good care. All right, my friend Jerry. Jerry, gonna, how about you? What's on your What's on your mind? Hey, I'm I'm wondering if taking into taking in the good is the same as uh, choosing to be positive. Is it what to be I'm positive? Choosing? No. Choosing to be positive. That's good. Hey, I, that's I'm glad, the I'm, yeah, I'm glad you asked. So, <clears throat> I don't think of it that way at all. Uh, I, what I mean is. I think there's a place in life to choose how we will relate to things, okay? And we could say, I, I myself am weary or leery rather, and weary too, of positive thinking, looking on the bright side. I just think there's so many pitfalls with that, you know? I wouldn't want to choose to be negative either. I mean, we know each other well, Jerry. There's mutual respect there. You know, I... I want to be realistic. And then, so for me, I, when I want to be realistic, I can choose my, my main goals. I can choose my values. I can choose how I'm going to relate to the situation. I can choose my plan. And for me, there's choice there, but I, and maybe the results of that are positive. But for me, that's a little different from the connotations, I guess, of you know looking on the bright side, choosing to be positive, the power of positive thinking. You know, I'm I, I wouldn't go there myself. And then second, by taking in the good, I'm talking about internalizing beneficial experiences, some of which are not emotionally positive. Healthy remorse, the, the sting or wince of healthy remorse to, to let it land so you never ever do that again. That's helpful. And I think also that a lot of what we um, take in is it's a cognitive, it's neutral. In other words, we take in a perspective, we develop wise view, we take in wise view, like in the Eightfold Path, or we develop um, um, confidence uh, in a certain view, we believe it, you know, uh, that's important as well. It's, it becomes credible to us, we help it land. A lot of uh, practice is, about, is helping yourself believe things that are true and good for you that are hard to believe like that you're a basically good person. I guess so that's what I would say. And um, hopefully that's helpful. I think of taking in the good as fundamentally about being kind to ourselves and supportive, you know. Um, life is challenging and stressful and difficult and uh, we need help. There's a humility in taking in, taking in the good that says, I am dependent. I need to eat. I need to breathe. And I need to eat and breathe psychological nutrition. Right? I need it. It's okay to be needy. We are needy. Embrace our neediness. We need the good. Right? Anyway, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, thank you all for hanging in there. And um, why don't we just take three breaths or so, to kind of take in the good of practicing together. I see your faces, you see my face, I see your names, um, I see you're here. You can see each other, we are here together. You might wanna look at the screens on Zoom. We're practicing together. You can see the, you know, the, the residues of suffering in people's faces. You can also see the residues of love, commitment to practice, longing for truth and happiness. So thank you very much.